Welcome to Building Bridges, the program committed to supporting the women and men of the New York City Police Department. I'm your host, retired Sergeant Joe Crescito. And joining me again today is Dr. Falkoff. He's a member of the Foundation for a Drug-Free World, and he's the president of the Americas chapter. It's a pleasure to be here with you, oh, Joe. So happy you were able to return. You know, we, we it, it, this is a good program. It, it's it, very it, important what we're doing for the community, yes. Absolutely. But before we get into the program, mm -hmm. I want to mention something to the viewers. At one time, about a year ago, I was a community partner in the one-to-one -one precinct uh, which is all part of the community policing philosophy. And uh, I had to step away because there's a lot of work to do with this program. And, and this program is a good vehicle to uh, get out to the community what they need to know about what's happening here on Staten Island. And two of the police officers, uh, matter of fact, their neighborhood coordination officers, I don't want to mention their name just yet, but because they're waiting for approval from the department. Mm. They want to get involved with this program. And this program is just as good, if not better, than the, the Build the Block meetings that they hold here in the community. Mm. You know, the Build the Block meetings, sometimes it's inconvenient for a person to show up and attend these meetings. It's, uh, you know, so they don't get as many people there as they'd like to. Mm. But uh, with this program being the vehicle to get out the word to the community, many, many more people will see what's going on in, on Staten Island. And like I said, there's this uh, neighborhood coordination officer, one in particular, he is so enthusiastic mm -hmm. about coming on the show. Well, you know what, when you look <clears> at it, with most of the shootings, the person who's doing the shooting is on drugs. So the importance of this is so vital. And then if you look at it also in terms of families and what the families are going through right now with their kids mm -hmm. and with this uh, culture that exists of drugs that these young generation has been born into, I, I know that there's going to be a lot of agreement, like you just mentioned in these meetings, that will unite and galvanize mm -hmm. the police department, the community, in an effort uh, that's really benefits everyone. It's a win-win. Yeah. I, I think your idea is fantastic and we'll definitely support it wholeheartedly. Thank you, thank you. And, and you know, like I said, he's waiting for approval from the department. I know, uh, going back a little more than a year ago, my first guest on the first show was uh, Ben Tucker, the first deputy commissioner. Mm -hmm. um, ben and I go back to the 70s when we both served on the faculty of the police academy. And I had asked him, I said, listen, would you mind if we, we get police officers from the local precincts to come on the show? He said, that's great. Yeah, do it. Absolutely. So he's approved it. And uh, from a legal point of view, uh, right now, the officers that want to come on, they, they got to get clearance from the department. They have to get clearance from the office of the Deputy Commissioner of Public Information. And they want to make sure that they can do it. 100%, no problem. Uh, from what I understand, the commanding officer or one of the precincts out here wants to come on the program. Right. I've had commanding officers on previous shows. As a matter of fact, if you Google Joe mm -hmm. Crescito, mm -hmm. C-R-O-C-I-T-T-O, building bridges, you will come up with every program that we did over the last year. Right. And And... People will enjoy it. Uh, the one that really stands out, actually there's two. Uh, the the one that's, uh, first one that stands out is when I had the police department banned on the program. Mm -hmm. What a most enjoyable day that was. We had about 30 musicians on stage in the wow. big studio next wow. door. What a performance they put on. It must have been beautiful. Oh, it was fantastic. Well, and, I, mean, uh, I wanted to interject something into what you're saying. Uh, and also for, you know, those people in YPD who are looking at this is that one of the things that we've done in the uh, program that I'm a very strong believer in is we've gotten all uh, religious entities involved because, you know, to me, spirituality and religion is very important for our communities. Sure. And so we've gotten Bishop Ashla, you know, Bishop Moise, uh, Rabbi Lev Abdurrahmanov, uh, Rabbi Gamboa, 
you know, all different kinds, of, you know, ministers, Catholic priests. Uh, I have one in my own practice who, who, who loves the program. I don't want to mention his name since he's a patient. But what I can tell you is, uh, and also Reverend, there's another one right here on Staten Island who does a tremendous amount of work that we're looking forward to, is Reverend Barrett Lane, who does a lot here on Long, uh, right on Staten Island uh, with drug education and uh, has oh, really? sporting activity. And, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you, and I think you met, uh, Globetrotter Bobby Hunter, who wants to bring basketball involved. So to me, I think this is where we can unite forces and do something very positive that, that sets an example. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, there's a new thing that came out today mm -hmm. <clears throat> where they want the community to get involved. This is all coming from the mayor in selecting the priest and commanding officer mm -hmm. in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a good idea because if they're happy with who they select, then the cooperation, like, automatically could be there. Up. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I spoke with him at his uh, Christmas gala at Gracie Mansion. It was about a year and a half ago. It says more than a year now. He actually is very pro the community. And so I think it's a great idea that the community has a big say in what's going on. So is that, you know, a, a continuity between the two, the correlation. Mm -hmm. Back in the 70s, when I worked in the 2-4 precinct, we mm -hmm. had something very similar. They didn't call it community policing. Uh -huh. It was called a neighborhood police team concept. Mm -hmm. And it was along the same lines. And let me tell you something. What it did for the relations between the police and the community, unbelievable. Right. We got along with them so well. Uh, there were times that um, my partner and I would be in the radio car. We'd go on a call. And um, we're addressing the issue at hand. And then a, another call comes over in the sector that we're assigned. But we couldn't go because we were at the call that we were, you know, addressing at the moment. Mm -hmm. So what they would do is send another radio car to the call in my sector. Mm -hmm. Within maybe five minutes, and that, this didn't happen every time, but on occasion... The radio car that was addressing the call in my sector that I couldn't go to, they'd get a hold of the radio dispatcher to ask that we show up at that call because the community wanted to deal with me and my partner. You know the feeling that was? Amazing. Oh, uh, you looked forward to going to work every day. What an acknowledgement. Oh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to repeat myself, but I always tell the story about... Uh -huh. um, uh, a group of Latino men, one morning at 3 o'clock, uh, they were playing uh, dominoes, uh -huh. hot summer morning. And uh, I had to go to the bodega that they were sitting in front of to get, uh, to get something. And when I came out, a guy came down the street the wrong way in a car. So there I am in uniform. I have to stop him, you know. So uh, I stopped the guy. He gets out of the car. He's giving me a hard time. Yeah. And all the guys playing in dominoes at the uh, card table, they got up and surrounded him. What a feeling that is. Virtually every cop in that precinct had a good relationship with the people in the community. And, you know, I'll never forget one time, you know, monthly they have these community uh, meetings with the precinct commander. People from the community come in and they discuss issues. The precinct commander is there and... Uh, one one time, besides the precinct commander being there, the pr president of the precinct community council is also present mm -hmm. running the meeting, you know. Mm -hmm. So one time somebody made an allegation against me and my partner okay. at, the, at this meeting. Yes. So right, I don't want to go into too much detail with it, but the captain got up when the allegation was made and said, I'll go downstairs now, I'm going to suspend those two offices. With that, the president of the community council stopped him and said, if you do that, you will have trouble in this community by suspending those two offices. I found this, this out later on, sure. you know, but what a good feeling that is. Yeah, they had you your know? back. Yeah, the community wow. had my back. That's right. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, you know, when, when you work together... That just happens. Uh, I was actually abroad one time uh, doing this program, actually. 
and um, there was someone there who was causing <clears throat> difficulty. It was a similar story. And um, for some reason, everybody wanted me to fix the problem. <laughs> so I dealt with this man uh, who looked like a, a linebacker. And um, after about 10, 15 minutes, someone came out from the crowd and spoke to the guy. And uh, he said, you know, he's, he's Dr. Fialkos, a visitor here, bring this to our country. And I think you should show a little better uh, manners to our guest. <clears throat> and, you know, the next day I saw the guy. We got along really well. And uh, we got along so well that I said to him, you know something? I see that you actually like the program. He goes, I do. I was just upset yesterday. I said, but you know what? I see you stand up for things. So how would you like to be the bodyguard for this group? And he lit up. He said, absolutely. Wow. So he, he ended up being our, our, our bodyguard. And you know what? When you take people's uh, character and you take it for a positive action, things happen in a, in a positive way. So that I totally can understand <clears throat> what, what you're talking about because I found that. But that's why I think that the program is so important. And, you know, there's a video I wanted to show because when we're here, you know, we talk about families, mm -hmm. we talk about our community, but we're also talking about our kids. And, you know, I saw this video. It's a little bit strong, but I think it's important. And let me see if I can get this play this for you. It's about babies. The crying goes on for hours. This baby boy was born addicted to prescription pain medication. That high-pitched, gasping for breath scream is just one of the telltale signs. Drug addiction has nothing to do with socioeconomic status or race. It is across the board. You will see them at every, every birthing hospital in this city. The U of L neonatal intensive care unit saw 50 babies born addicted just last year alone. That's up from four in 2005. More than 730 cases were reported statewide. Oxycodone, Percocet, heroin, morphine, um, things that you can get with a prescription and things that you can get illegally on the street. WDRV News introduced you to Tiffany Hicks last July. She was so high on pain pills during her labor that she doesn't even remember giving birth to her daughter. I was shooting at least 20 30s a day, 20 30 Oxycodone a day. The baby was sent to live with a friend. Hicks is now getting treatment. It took me getting sober to realize what I had done to my child. University Hospital will participate in a statewide conference in Frankfurt this week, sharing its best practices for treating addicted babies. After much research, the hospital now treats them with morphine, slowly weaning the children off the drug. The entire process takes about 30 days, but that is not the case elsewhere in the state. There are hospitals in the state who don't have any way of treating these babies, so a lot of them go home. Probably some of these babies are going home not being appropriately treated. The conference is aimed at sharing information and bringing awareness to a problem that doctors say will likely only get worse. I think it's going to get worse in the short term, I'm afraid, just because of the going to the back to the street drugs. It's a dark road ahead in the Commonwealth if the problem is not addressed at a state level. And don't we owe that to the smallest victims? Seeing what's working in other places and trying to trying to find something that'll work for us. So you know I wanted to, to share that at the outset of the show because that's how much it's impacted our, our communities, our society. And this is uh, 2012 and obviously, with everything that's happened in the last year uh, and all the stress that our country has been under, those figures have gone up. Sure. And uh, so it's important to take a look. And, and what we're here today for is about training. Is And what you brought out is how together we can all start within our churches, our synagogues, our temples, our mosques, you know, our sporting activities, to really a united effort and, and create this educational war against drugs. You know what it is to, uh, it's a great idea to get religious institutions involved with this. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to schedule all these meetings at a time that's convenient for people. I mean, people come home from work, 
And especially here on Staten Island, if they live in the city, I mean, if they work in the city mm -hmm. and they take the express bus, by the time they get home, they got to sit down, they got to cook, they're tired, they're mm -hmm. exhausted. Mm -hmm. uh, take my godson, he, he, he gets up at 5.15 in the morning to catch the express bus at a quarter to six. My Lord. And by the time he gets home, he's exhausted. I'm sure. And you know, this physician that I, I met last week, he also lives on Staten uh -huh. Island. He's in his office by 6.30 in the morning in Manhattan. Right. And he doesn't come home until about 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. You know, so when we schedule these meetings, I don't think they should be scheduled during the week. Probably by weekend. Weekends. And hopefully, you know, uh, if we can maybe do it on a Sunday or late on a Saturday or something. But as a doctor, I know, believe me, I have long hours. But absolutely, I agree with you. We can do that. Yeah. And, you know, a way of doing that is the pastors or the rectors or the rabbis that are in charge of these synagogues, they should allow a spokesperson from Drug Free each, World uh -huh. to come in uh -huh. to each service. Right. And, and let the people know, look, we're going to have these gatherings, these meetings. We're going to talk about this this issue. It's a big problem. Yeah. And um, we've got to get the word out. We've got to get the word out. It's Because it's not getting any better. No, it's, it's like like this video it was saying with, with <clears throat> babies, but it's actually true of any drug abuse, is it cuts across all religious institutions, all socioeconomic barriers. Yes. It really, there's no one is excluded from, the, from this drug problem that's going on. I know, I know. And, and the police officers, uh, they have a tough, tough job, you know, and, and they have to go after people within the guidelines of the Constitution. Uh, they can't deviate from those guidelines. There's... Uh, uh, search warrants that uh, if they want to get a search warrant, they got to convince a judge that the search warrant is warranted, you know. Right. It's a difficult job for them. And, and I was talking to a friend of mine. He's with the DEA. Yeah. As a matter of fact, he may be coming on the program that would be good, with yeah. us, you know. And, uh -huh. uh, it's not easy for them. No. They, they put in long hours and... Uh, it, it's it's tough. It's, it's a not tough a popular job. job. Not no, a it's not a job. popular job. No. It's very uh, tiresome, uh, frustrating. I sometimes say it's like being a parent. If be, if before if before you had kids, you realize what it was going to be like to be a parent. There's a lot of positives, but there's some tough tough parts of being a parent. You know, yeah, being very a father, tough. mother. That I don't know. It's only stories that I hear. You know, <laughs> but. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, you know. I mean, I can tell you when I was young. I grew up in Connecticut, in Manchester. And uh, I had a really close group of friends. There were three or four of us. And one night we were out. We we're teenagers, and we were, you know, we weren't doing anything really bad. But we were like, we we thought we did something uh, in the neighborhood that could be not looked at that well. And there was a police car, and so we got nervous. And there was really nothing much that we did, but we started <clears> running. <throat> so he chased after us. He got us, and he brought us back to our individual homes. Mm -hmm. And you know, I want to say that because. He could have made a big deal out of it. Really, all he was trying to do was really to get us to realize to act in the proper way. And so he brought us to each home, went to the mother and the father at the door. He was very nice, spoke to them. He brought us in. And, uh, you know, I remember, I never forgot it. He created the impact that he had to. And he didn't do anything really over the edge or that wasn't called for. it. And so I thought it was really good. So I really, to be honest with you, if you look at it, and if you have a loose criminal in the neighborhood, or he's shooting people, or he's uh, accosting people, or he's mugging people, who's going to take care of it? It's a policeman. So I really think, like every other facet of life, we have to also acknowledge those agents in our society who help us have a calm society, which the police, the DEA, there's certain institutions that are important, you know? Well, you know, these, these groups that are out there, suggesting that the police be defunded. I, I don't know if they know what they're talking about. As a matter of fact, I saw something today on the Internet. The owners of an ice cream company, I don't want to mention the name, but it's a very popular ice cream company. You see their product in the supermarkets. They're starting a movement. Mm -hmm. it, it's bad enough that they, they their company funds organizations that go against the police, but now they're starting a movement 
to make it much more easier for people to sue police officers, and they're going after them. Well, let me let me make a point that's very that maybe is not really looked at enough. We have a drug problem. That drug problem is pervasive in all professions and walks of life. So you have people drugged, and when people are drugged, they don't act rational. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether they're a lay person, uh, a doctor, a, a clergy, or a police officer. We found that there really there's no group <clears throat> that's excluded from the drug problem. So with that reality in mind, we have to take a look at, we have as a society, as a family, let's say, of a society, community, we have a drug problem that causes irrational behavior. Now, if we go at the symptoms of the disease, we never get the disease. What we need to do is to go at the disease. The disease is the drug. Mm -hmm. So the drug usage needs to be curtailed. And by educating people, we can curtail that. What happens, you curtail that, then the behavior also becomes more rational because the drug use goes down. So when the drug use goes down, the whole community behavior is more rational. Unfortunately, one of the things that you and I were talking about the last show is is a drug culture that's been pervasive in the society where it's become normal to use drugs. If you, if you really look at it, and I think we should concentrate on this, is instead of bashing uh, institutions, uh, is that, uh, you know, there's been a legalization of a drug called marijuana. And we went over last show how the marijuana actually is causing an increase in opioid usage. That it actually is by, by scientific studies, not by opinion, but by American Medical Association, psychiatric journals, showing that the marijuana usage is leading to that increased opioid usage, psychotic symptoms, the National Institute of Health, Dr. Nora Volkov, many, many, many different sources. So if you look at that, and then you put that with what's going on in the world, then you come to the conclusion, well, I could ask, you know, I could criticize this person. Or I could say the father need, or the mother, their parents aren't doing their job. But the reality is, is we took a look at the drug problem and we tackled it together, including this ice cream company who probably mm -hmm. they want to do something. And in their eyes, they think it's the police. The one, the last thing I wanted to say is this, is that, you know, and I'll say it personally, I have never been perfect. There are things that I have learned from, and I think all of us do, uh, where we improve ourselves. And I think it's important that all our walks of life, all our professions, physicians, the, the police, the politicians, the religious leaders, we all need to improve. Mm -hmm. This last year, I think if anything, I've seen something that was very positive. I think we've come together more. So I think one of the things that I would like to come out of this show is instead of attacking each other, let's attack the real enemy. There's something in the art of war. In the art of war, you get people to fight with each other, and they occlude who the real enemy is, and the enemy is sitting back there laughing and gaining everything. So I think what I would love to point out to the ice cream company, to maybe some different walks of life where we're upset, even the police themselves, the religious leaders. Let's take a look at the real enemy. This is the real enemy. Drugs are the enemy of all of us. There's no one out there who wants their son or daughter on drugs. I don't think we have to do a survey or a census or a poll. So with that in mind, let's spend some time in this country on eliminating drugs, improving the environment, and seeing if all these other things that we're doing don't work out for the better. I would hate to think that we defunded certain sectors and all of a sudden our country finds out a year or two later this is a big problem. I would hate to be in that position. You know, the, the shame of it all is it, there's far too many people in this country and in the world that to them drugs is a way of life. And we've got to convince them otherwise. Well, let, let's go into that because this is, you know, you brought me today to talk a little bit about training. And uh, I think we spent time on some very important factors that, that have to do with why it's so important for us to train. So I want to make some, some just note of a few different things here. This is from the White House Office uh, National uh, Drug Control Policy. The simplest and most effective way to lessen the use of drugs is to prevent it in the first place. And then a uh, next one, which we have here from the 
National Institute of Drug Abuse, from Dr. Nora Volkov, who's the director of the institute, increased perception of risk decreases drug use in youth. So in order to get this, then what we need to do is obviously we need to educate. So how do we educate? So let's take a look. And uh, if you have, uh, I gave you the booklet there. Uh, our program actually has a curriculum. It's called the mm -hmm. Drug-Free Educator Kit. Some curriculum. You like it? Oh, I love it. Why don't you hold it up so they can see it? Yeah. This is the curriculum booklet for those of the, the, the teachers out there, the police captains, you know, the, uh, the religious leaders who want to maybe run into Sunday schools. It's in 22 languages. And uh, if you open it up, Joe, the audience can see that this is laid out pretty much like add water and mix. Because they realize, like Joe said, we don't, who has time in today's world? Oh, very little time. So the reality is that there's a lesson that goes one per week on each different factor. One is our drug culture, because these kids, they don't realize they're in a drug culture. Right. The number two is, why did people turn to drugs? Because maybe, I don't know about you, but uh, I mean, when I was in high school, there were some times where there were some difficult, stressful situations dealing with, with girls, dealing with the guys, dealing with the school. Did I you know, find that yourself or what? Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about, believe me. You think that the program is so important, and you know, there's a video I wanted to show, because when I we- given us education on what tobacco use will do to you, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have COPD today. Wow. I look at these young kids today. I want to go up and say something. They, they, they're they out in the street. They're, they're either vaping yeah. or they're smoking cigarettes. Right. And, or uh, both. Yeah. Well, both, and it, it's so harmful to these kids, so harmful. Uh, absolutely. That's, that's why this, this curriculum that we have, and I know you had asked me if we'd be willing to hold training. Uh, we can't do it, obviously, in person, but we still can hold webinars. I personally, recently in the last few months, have held those for the dental societies on vaping because vaping has caused a lot of harm intraorally in the mouth with a lot of diseases mm. of decay, gum disease, sure, sure. Uh, even it causes heart problems, different things that the doctors need to know. But we can hold the same webinars, you know, for the police, for the communities, for the religious leaders. And uh, the booklets that you see, you can order. You can get them free online at drugfreeworld.org. Uh, if you need it in Spanish, you can order it in Spanish, in Russian, in uh, Hebrew, in Chinese, uh, German. It's in 22 languages. Unbelievable. That's that's great. Well, listen, uh, we're, get, we're nearing the close of the program, but I do want to mention something to the studio audience sure. uh, regarding the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Even though you're vaccinated, mm -hmm. you must still wear your mask. We don't know how long this inoculation will last. Yes. It remains to be seen. So... We're still um, learning. We're still learning, absolutely. Yeah. And the That's doctors right. will admit to that, too. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm waiting to get called for, for my uh, vaccine, uh, but rest assured, I will be wearing my mask until Dr. F what's his name? Forci Forci says it's safe to take it off. I don't know how, when that's going to happen. It's going to be a, a good year out from now. Sure. Well, that's so, what we do in our office. We yeah. wear masks, we distance, and, yeah. you know, the, the good thing is that we're working together on this. Absolutely. You know? Well, I want to thank the audience uh, for tuning in again. Uh, and, uh, you know, just stay safe, wear your mask, don't take any chances, and um, we'll see you next time. So... Stay well and God bless.